Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here worshiping you. We ask a blessing upon this time. In thy name, amen. Leviticus 25, 25 says, If your brother becomes poor and sells his property, then his next of kin shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. So what does that mean? What is a kinsman? Well, kin or next of kin is relatives, close relatives. By definition, a kinsman redeemer was someone who redeemed what was lost. That could be a person's property, it could be their freedom, or even their name. A kinsman might, might also be called upon to exact revenge on someone who may have killed a relative. So, in short, a kinsman is a rescuer or a restorer. Now, if, if my brother sold a piece of property and I had the money, I could come along and pay what he sold it for and it becomes my property. It doesn't go back to him, it becomes mine. It's mine to deal with. So then I have to manage it. And uh, after the year, it's complicated, but after so many years, it goes back to him and his, his family. It was important in, in Jewish history that the children of Israel, they had 12 tribes. They were each given a certain plot, so to speak. And that was to remain in the tribe. So you were supposed to even marry within the tribe so that the property wouldn't leave the tribe. So if a whole bunch of people from Benjamin married people from Judah, the whole part of that part of Judah wouldn't become Benjamin. So it, it, it's really complicated. You can go back in Leviticus and read through it if you like. But it was important to redeem that. And you remember they brought this question to Jesus one time and they said, oh, this why a woman had seven sons and the oldest one married this woman and the son died so then the next brother married her and he died and the next brother and the next brother and then they want to know well whose wife will she be in heaven well it was just a trap for Jesus but that was the custom was if if the eldest brother died the next brother married the wife so that and then the son if they had a son that son would then carry on the first husband's name, his property would go to that son. And then they could have their own children for the, his property. And there are four things that are required in order to be a redeemer. One, you had to be kin. And number two, you had to be willing. Number three, you had to be able to redeem and you had to pay the price. Number four, you had to pay the price in full. So there's no partial redemptions. It's either a full redemption or it's no redemption. So now we can get to the story. It's the time of the judges. And there's been a drought in Israel. The crops are drying up. Their grapes aren't growing. The olive trees aren't producing. And Emelech and his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, they decide that they're going to go to Moab. They're going to travel, sojourn in Moab, which is an interesting choice. If you look at a map, Judah, if you have, the Dead Sea is in the middle. Judah's on this side. Moab's on this side. They live in Bethlehem, so they have to go up through Jerusalem, and they have to go around the north side of the of the Dead Sea to get over to Moab. And they go to Moab, and their two sons marry two Moabite women. Well, then Emelech dies there, and they're there for several years, and then the oldest son dies, and then the youngest son dies, and now Naomi is there alone with her two daughter in laws. She has no family there. She has no sons to take care of her. Her husband's dead. Her sons are dead. There's no one to take care of her, for her at all. So she decides, I must go back to Bethlehem. She has property there. So she might as well go back to Bethlehem. But of course, she's got these two daughter-in-laws. They pack up and they begin heading back. And finally, 
Naomi says to the daughter-in-laws, why, why should you come with me? I love you. I think you should go home to your parents. You can find new husbands and live a good life. But if you go with me, there's nothing. You'll be like me. I'm a foreigner in a foreign land and nobody cared for me there. Well, they cry and cry and they, they just, they can't leave her. But she finally, she talks Orpha into going back. So Orpha returns to her mother and she says to Ruth, Ruth, you too should go back to your mother. I was, you know, I'm not going to marry. I'm too old to marry. I'm not going to have any more sons and you certainly don't want to wait for these sons to grow up to be your husband. You should go back. But Ruth clings to her and says, no, I'm not going back. So they traveled to Bethlehem. I have to say, she also said, where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if even death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So, I, I forgot to tell you that it's, going to Moab is a strange place for them to go. Because when the children of Israel were coming, finally coming out of Egypt and were going to be crossing Moab, God told them to go ahead and cross Moab, but don't touch the people, don't just stay on the road, leave them alone because they are your relatives. The Moabites are the descendants of Lot, Lot and his daughter, and you're to leave them alone. Well, the Moabites, when they crossed their land, they were scared to death of them, of the children of Israel, because they'd seen what the children of Israel did to the Amalekites, and they were afraid. So they called on Balaam, Balaam, come down here and curse these people, please. They're, they're infesting our land and they're taking over everything. And Well, Balaam comes down and they promise him all kinds of... And then, of course, Balaam, you've got the great story about the donkey talking, and, but that's another sermon altogether. Balaam comes down and he stands up there and he blesses them and... Balak's like, what are you doing? He says, I paid you to curse him. He says, I can't do anything but what God tells me to do. And Balaam goes home. And after that, the Moabites are cursed. No Moabite can come into the temple. And they said, even if under the tenth, if they move in to Israel, if they become Israelites, they still can't go into the temple up to the tenth generation. So it was a strange thing for him to go there. And then Noabites worshipped Chumoth, who was, a war, who was a war god, and Ashtari. Now Ashtari, we're all familiar with her because she was worshipped in Egypt, in Ugrid, among the Hittites, as well as in Canaan. Her Akkadian counterpart was Ishtar, who we get the name Easter from. Later she became assimilated with the Egyptian deities of Isis and Hathor, a goddess of the sky and of women, and of the Greco-Roman world as Aphrodite, Artemis, Juno, and Diana. Same goddess. So she, Ruth has said, she's disavowed those things and she's going with Naomi to this. So the two of them, they come to Bethlehem and they cause a sensation. Naomi, you're home, you're back. And all the people are welcoming Naomi and Ruth, and Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, because Naomi is the name that means pleasant. And she says, I left here, things were good, but when I came back, calamity has come, so call me Mara, Mara, which means bitter, because her life has been bitter since she left. uh, I'm assuming they move into whatever property, that Naomi has, but they don't have any support. In 
In Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyards a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner. So this is what they're going to do. This is how they're going to live. Naomi has this kinsman of her husband, a man of wealth, a man named Boaz. And she tells Ruth that you can go out and harvest in the fields. Well, actually, Ruth, it's her idea. to let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain. So she says, go, my daughter. It's a dangerous thing for her to do because she's not well-known. She's a foreigner. She dresses different. She acts different. She looks different. And she's in a foreign land. So she goes out and she begins gathering grain. She picks a field. Looks good. People, the harvesters are out there harvesting. So she asks the head person, can I glean in this field? And he gave her permission. And she goes along and she's picking this grain from the edges of the field. And they sigh it off, of course. And some of it they pick and they leave a few here and there. And she goes along and she's picking that up. Now, Boaz comes to out to see how the harvest is going. And he says to his servant who is in charge of the reapers, whose maiden is that? And the servant in charge of the reapers answers, it's the Moabite maiden who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, pray let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now without resting for even a moment. So she's a hard worker out there in the heat I've uh, spent a lot of time in grain fields in July harvesting oats and stuff. And boy, it's hot out there in the summertime and uh, with nothing over you. And she's working hard. Now Boaz, he's heard of her because he knows of of Naomi and he's heard all the things that she's done for Naomi. So Boaz says, listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my maidens. Let your eyes be upon the field which they are reaping and go with after them. Have I not charged the young men not to molest you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. She then fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of her husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord recompense you for what you have done and a full reward be given by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, you are most gracious to me, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not one of your maidservants. So, at mealtime, Boaz says, come on in, we're we're having lunch. Come on in and join us. So she comes in and has lunch and he gives her a portion. She eats all that she can and she's still got more, so she saves that up to take home. And Boaz then instructs his young men saying, when you're gleaning among the sheaves, do not, or when she is gleaning among the sheaves, do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles and leave it for her. So he's, make, he's making that easier for her and, and trying to make things better. He is going out of his way for her. I mean... The, the Jewish people claim that Boaz was an old man, that he was probably 80 years old. Well, who knows? It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us that he had a previous family or anything. But he's noticed this young lady in his field. He knows she's a hard worker, and he's heard what she's done for Naomi, a kinsman of his. <coughs> Excuse me. So she gleans in the field until evening 
and then he beats out what she has gleaned, and she has about 25 pounds worth. It says an, an epheth of barley, which is about 25 pounds. So she took it up and went to the city, showed her mother-in-law what she had gleaned, and she also brought out the food that she had saved from lunch. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she says, well, I worked in a field of a man named Boaz. <laughs> and Naomi's like, whoa, Boaz, huh? I know Boaz. He's a kinsman. He's been, he's been good for you. Well, that's a good thing. You keep close by his, uh, his reapers, his maidens, stay with them and work with them. So she does. Day after day, she works in the, in the barley fields. And then the barley's done, the wheat's ready, and she works in the wheat fields. Now, Naomi, she's, oh, obviously she's treating Ruth like a daughter. And she, finally, she, the wheat harvest is almost done, probably the last day. She says, my daughter... Should I not seek a home for you that it may be, may be well with you? Now, is Boaz not a kinsman with whose maiden you were? See, he was winning barley tonight at the fleshing, for threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating to the man. And drinking, and when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And Ruth says, All that you said I will do. So the harvest is done. This is probably the last night. They're going to finish beating out the rest of the wheat, harvest, and they'll probably have a little party. And they'll have a good meal, they'll have, have some wine. They'll all be satisfied. They'll sit around and fall asleep. So Ruth goes down. Boaz watches. She just keeps an eye out. She takes the bath, puts on her best clothes. But Ruth warned, no, don't paint your face. Don't look like a harlot. Just go down there. After, notice where he goes to sleep. So he went around behind the pile of wheat, leaned back and went to sleep. And after he was asleep, she slipped in, lays down, near, uncovers his feet, and lays down at, by his feet. Well, this is pretty strange in our day and age to think of something like this, but it was a custom in their day. During the middle of the night, he rolls over or moves, and his foot hits something, and he jumps up with a start. And there's this woman laying there. Who are you? She sits up. Behold, a woman laid his feet. Who are you? He says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your skirt over your maidservant, for you are next of kin. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord. Your daughter, my daughter, you have made this the kind, last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask, for all of my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of worth. And now it is true that I am a near kinsman, yet there is a kinsman nearer than I. Remain the night and in the morning, if he will do the part of the next of kin for you well, let him do it. But if he will not be willing to do it, the part of the next of kin for you, then I will. So she stayed there till the next morning, but arose before anyone could recognize another. And she went back to Naomi, and Naomi says, how did it go? Oh, before he left, or she left, he says, bring me your mantle that you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it out, and he measured out six more measures of barley, which is about 50 pounds, and laid it upon her. How many of you can carry 50 pounds? When I worked on the farm, I could throw 50-pound bales of hay around, 50-pound sacks of feed, no problem, but I wouldn't try it today. And that's a lot of weight. You throw that in a sack over your shoulder. She had a, a real load. Well, Naomi says, just wait. 
wait here and see how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Boaz, he goes to the gates of the city of Bethlehem, and he waits there, and he waits until the other kinsmen come out. And he says, the other kinsman is coming out, he's on his way to his fields, and he comes out, he says, stop, I have to talk to you for a while. He says, we have to talk about something. And he says, and then he says to the elders, and this is the place where the old, <clears throat> the old men gathered uh, gossip in the morning. They're the elders of the city, and he gets 10 of them there, and he has this kinsman, and he says, we have this matter. You are the next of kin for Naomi, and she has property to sell, and she wants to sell it. Are you willing? And he says, yeah, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Well, there's one catch. You have to redeem Naomi by marrying Ruth. Oh, um, well, in that case, you're the next kinsman. You go ahead. You see, he doesn't want to... The thing is, it's like I read earlier, if he buys the land, he marries Ruth has a son by Ruth, that land becomes that son's land and he loses ownership of it at that point when that son becomes a man. So he's like, he's going to buy the land and then have to give it back. It's like, nah, that doesn't work for me. I'm not that financially secure. So Boaz says, okay, in that case, I will buy it. We have these witnesses here. So the man who, the kinsman who refused takes off his sandal and gives it to Boaz. This, is, this signs their contract. Everybody has seen it. So, the elders all approve. I got to get to the point after that. So the land, now Boaz is going to, will have a son with Ruth, and that son will become the son of Malon, her first husband, and he will then inherit that land. But Boaz then, he takes Ruth as a wife, he has Naomi as a mother-in-law, and they're both taken care of. See, God worked it out. And in fact, the elders of the city give this, this woman, Ruth, they bless her, and they say, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because the children of the Lord will give, will give you by this young woman. They want, they're, they're giving them a blessing that they have a multitude of children like Jacob and Leah and Rachel. So they, they have a son. Naomi takes the son. They call him Obed. And Naomi raises him. Now, there's a genealogy at the end here. Now, these are the descendants of Perez. Perez was the son of Judah. But this Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Abinadab, Abinadab of Nation, Nation of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David. So Ruth becomes an ancestor of King David. But does anybody know who Salmon's wife was? Rahab? So Jesus' lineage is quite interesting. I just want to remind you that Obed is a type of Jesus. You see, Obed went out of his way. He did all those, all those things that are required to be a kinsman redeemer. Jesus did the same thing. He had to be our kin. He had to be willing. He had to be able to redeem. And he had to pay the price in full. 
Thank you. Father, today we are so grateful that you chose to be our kinsman redeemer, that you came, became one of us so that we could relate best to you and then gave it all so that we could someday be at home with you. Father, thank you for your great love for us and for this whole church family. We thank you for all the blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.